Secret Origins Podcast, Episode 17. Welcome to episode 17 of the Secret Origins Podcast. We have been going unlimited. I am your host, Steve and Mike, and joining me is Lupus Convoy. Hello, sir. Hello again, sir. How are you? I'm still alive. <laughs> Yay. Today we'll be starting season four of Justice League with the first four episodes. So what's been going on with you, sir? Uh, the week from hell. I, everyone who's in college knows about midterms. Shudder. Let's not go back to that dark, dark black place. <laughs> so how about you, sir? Uh, it's been going good. And, uh, it's kind of iffy. It, it, it varies from day to day, so... <laughs> I've mainly just been watching a lot of TV, obviously podcasting. Not, obviously not for this show, but been doing a lot of other stuff, uh... We're up to episode 25 of Beast Unleashed podcast. We're up to episode 76 coming up this week for um, Tooncast. Um, just usual stuff, I guess. Um, let's see. What else do we want to say in the intro? It's been a while. <laughs> I am insanely jealous of all our listeners that are going to be participating in NaNoWriMo this year. I unfortunately will not be able to because of school commitments, but... Doesn't mean I won't be pining to put words to paper or pixels to screen. Uh huh. Hmm. But um, for those that don't know what NaNoWriMo is, it's National Novel Writing Month, and the challenge is to write a complete 50,000 word novel from November 1st to November 30th. And while it seems like it could be easy, no. <laughs> so. Yeah, you have to have all your stuff, I have to have all your ducks in a row. And realize that you're going to get nothing done on Black Friday and Turkey Day and the day before Thanksgiving, and Mm -hmm. it adds up quick. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But other than that, I don't think I have anything else to say. All right. We are going to get into some episodes, then. It's all about to get ugly here, folks. Kind of late for a charity drop-off, isn't it, boys? (laughs) First up today for Season 4 of Justice League is the Cat and the Canary. And for the plot, we have Black Canary is on a stakeout and radios Wildcat to see why he isn't there to help as they arranged. 
He is in a meta brawl fight, but does not let Black Canary know. He only says that he'll be there shortly. Not willing to wait, Black Canary engages the criminals, and with her fighting ability in the Canary Cry, easily defeats them. After the fight, a portable television can be heard broadcasting the results of the meta brawl fight with Wildcat as the winner. Black Canary is clearly stunned. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, yeah. Later, Green Arrow is in training in a weight room in the Watchtower when the Black Canary invites him to spar with her. Uh, in the conversation before and during the spar, Black Canary is flirting with Green Arrow. She also hauls him to, to thinking, or lulls him into thinking that she is a, not a good fighter and tricks him into helping her with something outside of the league business. On a motorcycle ride... There, Black Canary tells Green Arrow that she is trying to get Wildcat out of Meta Brawl fights. As they try to talk to Wildcat out of it, he hears nothing of it, saying he is tired of being treated as a has-been and all cooped up in the Watchtower. His next fight with Atomic Skull is interrupted by Green Arrow and Black Canary, who try to stop the fighting. Other supervillains step in, and with Wildcat are set to defeat the heroes. Black Canary then proposes a different Meta Brawl to Roulette where she fights Wildcat. Roulette agrees, calls off the villains, and announces the new fight. <coughs> Excuse me. In the dressing room, Black Canary tells Green Arrow that she plans to beat Wildcat to force him to quit Meta Brawl. Uh, let's see. Uh, Green Arrow activates a sleep gas arrow in front of her, knocks her out, and then tells Roulette that he'll be fighting Wildcat. Green Arrow is clearly overmatched and getting beat in the ring. And he keeps goading Wildcat. Finally, Wildcat delivers a strong blow and seemingly kills Green Arrow. Watching from outside the cage, Black Canary is horrified while Roulette is thinking of how much the fights will bring in now that they've become death matches. Wildcat, however, is still in shock over the death that he caused and announces that he is out for good. After the arena has cleared out, Black Canary is seen later kneeling over the body of Green Arrow, when, she re- when he revives and tells her he used a stun arrow on himself to help him seem dead. She... Uh, I, she figures out his plan to start a wildcat enough for him to remember the power and force he has, and that he shouldn't misplace it. Wildcat stands over, admits that it worked. Black Canary then uses her canary cry to destroy the Meta Brawl Stadium. Back in the Watchtower, Green Arrow and Black Canary... Run with Wildcat as he prepares to sit down with John Jones to help him sort out his need to be in Meta Brawl. Green Arrow then invites Black Canary for some coffee. Okay, uh, thoughts? Okay, um, I love Dinah and that she's a hell of a fighter. And with the Sonic Scream. Um, I can definitely see why she is such a core member later on in the comics. Right. Um, you know, basically controlling the league at one point and being part of the uh, Birds of Prey. Um, Ollie, he's just awesome. He reminds me a bit of my dad, actually. Really? For some strange reason. Yeah. Um, maybe it's just the way that he talks. Maybe it's the go-to. <laughs> <laughs> um, Roulette, as we said off-air, she, for some reason, her character design looks really, really familiar to me. Uh, I don't know. Um but I think the tattoo looked really bad. Um, a nice little touch is that they kind of gave Wildcat cauliflower ears. Yeah. Um, which was kind of interesting. Like, I didn't... At first, the first two times I saw this, I was like, not catching that. On the third, I'm like, oh, he's got battle damage. Permanent battle damage. <laughs> okay. Um, the whole changing sequence, when the <laughs> GA is like, well, there's no place to change. And, uh... Canary, it's like, well, there's right here. Did you drop something? <laughs> um, yeah. And the entire time, I'm thinking, well, does the JLA just not have a good retirement plan? Really? Is that why Wildcat's really upset? I I don't know. Um, when they Canary says to Wildcat, you have to decide which side you're on, and then he steps out of the way of the villains... I didn't see that coming. Yeah, I didn't see that coming either. That was wow. Um, and this is only a hand. This is one of a handful of times we see Atomic Skull throughout the rest of the series. Yeah, I was surprised. This is the first time he shows up. Um, let's see. Um, we see Green Arrow get his um, 
his ass kicked. Yep. And then, oh my god, you killed Ollie. You bastard! <laughs> um, and, and the twist at the end where they have uh, Jean Jones help him get over the whole meta brawl situation. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why you keep a telepath. However, um, there was an old... Uh, a, no, a two-year-old comic, I think. Uh, the JSA, where it had Wildcat um, calling somebody on the phone in the hot tub saying, and what are you doing, Selena? <laughs> so now John will know about that. Can't keep a secret with those telepaths, can you? Well, but, um, I think that's all I've got th- for this semester. Yeah, yeah, it, this oh, semester? This, God, this episode. <laughs> wow. You know where my brain is, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we pretty much have the exact same note, except my first note was, oh, oh Black Canary, she's hot. <laughs> that was like when we first saw her. Um, I think, I, it, actually, actually it, yeah, it, it was when she, it was like when we first saw her, when she was getting ready to spar with Ollie the first time. In, in she's the taking off the jacket. Yeah. Uh, Ollie's jealous, and they haven't even been out on one date yet. I, I mean, I could see if they were, you know, like two or three weeks into a relationship and getting jealous, but haven't even been on a first date yet, and he's already getting jealous, and he doesn't even understand him? the situation. But can you blame him? I mean, come on. It's it's Dinah. I know, I know. He doesn't want to show that. Uh... <laughs> The music in this episode was just amazing. It was just so awesome. It was a nice touch. Yes, it was. Uh, one thing we do need to mention that uh, Dennis Farina voiced Wildcat. I thought it sounded familiar. Yep. Which, coincidentally, he is also doing the narration for Unsolved Mysteries now. Really? Yep. I didn't think they were still doing that episode, that uh, that show. Yep. It's on, I think it's on, um, oh man, I think it's A&E or Discovery, it, it is one of those, A&E, Discovery, or True TV, it's one of those stations, um, and like you said, I mean, GA just got his ass whooped, <laughs> and then, of course, the ending that I had was at least Wild Card, Wild Card, Wild Cat learned his lesson. Uh, the thing about the whole telepath thing was, I wonder if Jean is the therapeutic person for the entire league. Wouldn't you want somebody that's a little bit more human? Uh, wouldn't you want somebody who's a little bit more uh, objective? <laughs> objective, yes, but there might be some things that'd be like, "Well, my wife does. My wife used to do that to me all the time. Quit bitching." <laughs> I just think Bichy's wall. <laughs> I think it kind of. I think cultural it, rift. Yeah, I I think it kind of makes sense for him to be the therapist because, you know, obviously you can't keep any secrets from him. And what I'm really wondering is how many hours of therapy has Batman logged. <laughs> <laughs> None. Well, I mean, but that'll come in later. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Mm. I thought the um, a nice little twist on the end was when Ollie and Dinah are flirting, and he says, "Well, um, great, let's go out for coffee. You're buying," <laughs> and she looks so upset by that at first, like, "What? I'm buying." Never mind. He just dumped two thousand dollars on tickets for this thing. Yeah. Exactly. But you know, he only gets a, a million and a half after that sale. That company. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Still, it's a million and a half more than we have. Unfortunately. I wish I. Even if I did play the lottery, I know I would never win. But I wish I would. If I if I won the lottery, custom guy gardener figures. Oh God. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I have to throw them into every episode. Are you seriously telling me that if you won the lottery, that's all you would spend the money on is custom guy gardener figures? Well, not all of it, but that would probably be one of my first priorities. Wow. Just so I could ship them to you. Uh, yeah, and then I would 
make a YouTube video with them burning in the backyard. So there'd be money wasted, technically. Ah, uh, but I'd, I'd live on in YouTube infamy. <laughs> um, we have any other notes for, uh, 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 what the hell's the name of it? Uh, Cat and the Canary? Um, I think I've blown through them all. Yeah. I'm really surprised about how old they made them look, though. Wildcat, you mean? Yeah, because in the, in, in the current JSA, he's a, more distinguished. Kind of got the Reed Richards dual color hair thing going on. You gotta remember, this episode was made like five, six years ago. So the comic came out like recently. So I know, but that's what I'm saying. The recon, <laughs> <laughs> or retcon rather. Retcon, yeah. It was like recon. What recon? There's no recon mission. <laughs> um, I like seeing the canary cry animated. I mean, I th- and the only other time that I've really seen Black Canary was on the Birds of Prey series where Lori Laughlin starred as Black Canary. Um, and that was a nice effect there. But here, just seeing it in animation is nice. And I like how she says that she can't use it in the closed-in uh, arena with everybody around because it would kill everybody. So it, oh, she hold the power of acoustics. <laughs> well, you know, it is pretty loud. It's almost as... Well, no, it's it's not... It is louder than Night Scream, Sonic Scream, so that's always yeah. good. The, the question I have to ask from a, a biological standpoint, not how she generates it, but how she can generate it without making herself go deaf. Uh, Does she have earplugs in? She could have airplugs, yeah. Maybe, maybe she went to Princess Audrey and got some diamonds. I don't know. <laughs> oh, sorry, the science geek in me came out for a moment. Anyway, shall we? Oh, yeah, uh, I think we're gonna move on here. So, we're gonna move on to the next episode. What are you, the world's greatest escape artist, or the world's greatest idiot? For crying out loud, Scott, not even you can get out of this trap. That's what I like about you, Oberon. Your incurable optimism. Stop distracting him and get the canister. I hate to admit this, but Oberon has a point. Don't worry, darling. They don't call me Mr. Miracle for nothing. First rule of show business, never believe your own publicity. Craziest stunt you ever pulled. That's why we're rehearsing. Kid's got an answer for everything. Let's hope the train's running late today. Leave it to Sky Free to find the newest wrinkles. You sure given me a few. Little Faith. Scott, I thought you were dead. You inseparable showboat. I thought you were dead. When are you and Oberon going to learn that? Hey, where is Oberon? Up next, we have the ties that bind, a.k.a. Miracles Happen. Oh, Christ, kill me now. Yes, folks, it's that bad of an episode. Scott Free, a.k.a. Mr. Miracle, is rehearsing his latest escape act with the aid of his wife, Big Barda, <laughs> and his mentor, Oberon. It involves shackling his hands and feet, encasing him in a full-body sarcophagus, encasing the sarcophagus in a block of ice, and then dropping a train car on himself. Scott escapes, of course, but as soon as the dust settles, Oberon is nowhere to be found. Granny Goodness appears and says she's holding Oberon hostage. Granny Goodness returns, ladies and gentlemen. Because let's face it, folks, we're talking about Oberon. He's a midget. He could be confused with a really ugly child. Or or Gizmo. Ugh. <laughs> she explains that Darkseid's disappearance. Apocalypse has descended into a power struggle between herself... Sorry, himself. And Vermin Wunderbar. Wunderbar 
has gained the advantage by ca- capturing Kalabak, Darkseed's son, whom Vundabar plans to brainwash and use to legitimize his claim to the throne. Now Granny wants Kalabak for the same end. She needs Scott to rescue Kalabak from the X-Pit, Apocalypse's impenetrable prison. Scott escapes from the pit as a boy and remains the only person ever to do so. So I guess it's not that impenetrable. Yeah. Scott and Barda approach the Justice League for help, specifically Superman's help, but Jean refuses to aid them. The League cannot assist Granny in gaining control of Apocalypse as she would eventually threaten Earth. It is to their advantage to keep her, keep her and Wunderbar fighting. Barda storms out, followed by Scott. Flash protests, but Jean waves him down, saying Flash needs to look at the big picture. Despite this, Flash sneaks away and catches up to, to Scott and Barda and offers to aid them. Barda is skeptical, to say the least, saying that he's useless without Superman's strength and speed. But when Flash... Whoa. When Flash, when Flash shows them how fast he is, Scott realizes that he would be an, ex- an asset. The trio boom tubes to Apocalypse and, with relative ease, enter the pit. Scott halts, seeing that the layout to the place has been completely changed since he escaped, meaning his plans are now useless. Despite this, Barda and Flash insist on accompanying him. As they make their way through, Scott remembers his many escapes as a child, and the subsequent tortures by Granny in punishment, before he finally made it out fully. Granny tried time and again to break his spirit, but failed. While Scott and Barda engage in pit the pit guards, Flash hurriedly searches the prison and finds and releases Calabac, but that's the easy part. They make their way out, evading the pit's many death traps and their com- with their combined talents. When they are within striking distance of the exit, Wunderbar starts a self-destruct countdown, then flees. The prison goes up with an explosion, apparently taking it all inside with it. However, as Granny prowls the ruins of the pit, a boom tube opens and Scott, Barda, Flash, and Calabac emerge. Granny congratulates Scott on the success, then sweetly informs him that Oberon was going to be taught a lesson anyway. Then Calabac morphs into Jean, who swiftly reads Granny's mind and uses his telepathy to guide Flash to Oberon's cell with Darkseid's old palace. Okay, first of all, I don't get... When did they have... It doesn't even show you how they had time to go for the switch. Hey, it takes a while for Granny to show up. I mean, she's got a walker and all. Go ahead. <laughs> this allowed Flash to save him just before Granny's death trap kills him. Barda is all for killing Granny, but Jean reminds her that it is th- to their advantage to keep her and Wunderbar fighting. Barda contents herself with a good right cross to Granny's jaw, and the party leaves Apocalypse. Back at the Watchtower, Flash confronts Jean, and before the latter can speak, defends his actions. He may have disobeyed Jean's orders, but everything had worked out. They boomed it to the x from the expert to Earth, stashed Calabac and switched him with Jean, then booed back and managed to save Oberon. Jean, smiling, says he wasn't about to scold Flash, only challenge him to a game of brawling bots. Okay, sir, I know you have very strong opinions oh, about this. God. Go. Oh. This episode, I know everybody loves Jack Kirby. Most people love Jack Kirby. Most people love the New Gods and the Fourth World stuff. I absolutely know nothing about it. So this was an episode that really didn't have any meaning to me at all. Uh, A couple of the jokes and stuff are cool and all, but overall this episode, probably if we were giving it a grade, I would give it like a zero or a one. (laughs) Seriously, it just didn't, it just didn't resonate with me whatsoever. Um, I did like seeing Granny Goodness return. That was kind of cool. Uh, and <laughs> one of the jokes that I did like, couldn't your boob tube have gotten us any closer? It's, it's boom, boom tube. tube. <laughs> it was awesome. That was a nice line. Um, I do have to say with the, the, the scene where Scott was quote unquote making miracles with the lasers flying all around and stuff, that was kind of cool. It just, it was, it was an episode that I think that frankly just shouldn't have been made. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> well, at least you're very secure in how you feel about it. <laughs> I would give this an ep- this episode of five. Really? Out of ten. Why? Okay, I, I can defend my, my position on this, because we needed to see what was going on with Apocalypse. 
it's nice to know that the big baddie is is he's still gone. Yeah. What's happening behind what we see, you know? Um it Okay, yes, Jack Kirby. Okay, that's great. I I am not a huge fan of um that whole char- uh, the character designs that we've seen. I mean, Mr. Miracle's uh, costume just looks absolutely gaudy. And this is coming from somebody that runs around Paragon City in rainbow colored tights. I mean, it, it's it's pretty nasty looking. And Big Bart is not much of a difference. Um, if you want something that's really good with dealing with this character and the new gods and all this, go check out Batman Superman Apocalypse. That was an awesome DVD Blu-ray direct DC animation. And it it portrayed Bart a lot better than this Oh, I'd be a strong woman. Oh, I'm in love with, with Mr. Miracle. Oh, I'd be a strong woman. It just, it it also did a lot better for the character designs. Yeah. Um. Well, it's nice to see Granny Goodness again because it's it's Granny Goodness. She's awesome. And it's Ed Asner. <laughs> it, it. You know what? I didn't know who Ed Asner. <laughs> didn't know Ed Asner was doing the voice until I saw Apocalypse. <laughs> I'm like, and I'm sitting there with my other half, and we're watching it, and. Suddenly it's like, is that a man or a woman? <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure Granny Goodness is a woman, I, th- I think. I'm not sure about the voice actor. Oh, wait, that's Ed Asner. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> um, so I-, I love the Granny. I am very convinced that Mr. Miracle is just a teleporter. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, okay, another great thing about this episode, the Piv. Jeremy Piven's back, even if it's only for a little bit. Which voice or which which character? Elongated man. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, 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 yeah. You are. I've been doing this longer than anybody, and I still don't get respect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was oh. funny. Um, okay, so on top of that, we get a lot of Wally. Yeah, we haven't had a whole lot in comparison since the beginning of season three, so it's yeah. nice to finally get some more Wally centric episodes. Um. But okay, so some more little little picks. Okay, so I'm pretty convinced that Mr. Vundabar, which I was I could swear his first name was Vermin. It is. No, Vermin like the mice. It is. Are you serious? I think so. Keep going. I thought it was we'll it <laughs> Keep It's Vermin. Oh god, it's Vermin. It really is. Yeah, I told you. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. The spelling confused me. Um, I was convinced that it, it, this was really out of character for Sean. Like, I understand the whole detachment, and okay, I understand that things are need to be kept up with that status quo of them fighting, infighting. Mm-hmm. At the end of the episode, though, we didn't see that maintained because Wunderbar just blew up one of his base of operations. Well, I mean, it's implied that the fight will continue. I mean, it's not, you know, they're both, both of the camps, both Vundabar's and Granny Goodness's camps are hurting, obviously, but, I mean, it's still implied that the war will go on. Well, um, yeah, so I was a little thrown that Mr. Miracle is the stepbrother of Calabac. That's kind of weird. Yeah. I'm a little convinced. Like, which... Oh, no, no, no. Okay, whoa, whoa, wait. Let me remember this right. High Father and Dark Side switch sons. Yes. So, Calabac was High Father's Father's son. Biological son. Right. So, technically, Scott is the stepbrother to Calabac. So obviously, High Father has something to do with Scott. Uh, Are we sure? Is it High Father's mistress or yeah, nothing I, at the time? I, I, so, we need a flowchart, well, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I, I was going to say because there's no way Scott would be. Um, um, there's Hanging no way out. Scott would be a stepbrother to Orion because Orion was Dark Side's son. Orion was the. Was the adopted son of Darkseid, not biologically. 
Mm. Confused? So am I. <sighs> no, I have to go back and watch Twilight. No, not those fucking <laughs> stupid movies, but the episode from Justice League Season 2. Um, it's sad that I thought that first before the, the horrible <laughs> Stephanie Myers. Yeah. I anyway. think what I'll I'll go back and watch Twilight after the after we finish the recording, but I think what happened was High Father and Dark Side each had a son. They they swapped it. And they swapped the them. Backs. Right. So Kellaback is actually High Father's child and Orion is actually Dark Side's child. I don't yep. know. I don't know if they're adopted. I don't know if they found some hot siren somewhere with Cersei. I d I don't know. But the way I understand, wow, Cersei gets all around a lot, doesn't she? <laughs> I, the way I it was, I, a, it was a calm night in the, the the pit of eternal torment. <laughs> exactly. The way I understand it is that they are their biological children. I could be wrong. I don't know. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> so speaking of really screwed up children, um, back to Calabac. <laughs> So, when Vermin Vunderbar um, says, my last, uh, my last resort, and hands up, cake! <laughs> and I, I thought that was hilarious. And then what was better was the fact that Calabac spits towards it. And I go, that's right, Calabac knows the cake is a lie. <laughs> and then it's headphones, which I'm sure were blasting either Yanni... Or Justin Bieber. Either way, not a way I'd want to go. Uh, okay, so um, <clears throat> Oberon and Granny. They could be married. Why not? They sound like it. <laughs> yeah. So three superheroes. No, okay, mind you, the Flash is pretty up there, but the other two, they're pretty lame. They take out all those soldiers of Apocalypse. Why are we worried about them except for Darkseid? Darkseid. Yeah. Really? Well, you know, the whole point of, you know, from Twilight to now, Darks, after Twilight, Darkseid's gone. They didn't want to Bruce Tim and the creator. They didn't want to just bring him back because if you, you know, you can only use Darkseid so much. And he had already been used in Superman the Animated Series multiple times. They used him in Justice League a couple of times. Not They didn't use him, like, really, really big, but because of the whole Superman the Animated Series line of, Apocalypse and Dark Side and uh, Inner Gang and all that stuff in Superman the Animated Series, when they blew him up in Twilight, they wanted him to stay gone because that way they could bring in other villains and whatever else. So, yeah. What else? Um, yay for Calbac's voice, which we've said before. Michael Dorn. War. Yep. yep. <laughs> I'm going to blow up the entire complex. Awesome. This is my type of villain. He makes sure that people can't escape. He's <laughs> smart. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the big surprise. Really? Mr. Miracle, if you escape, do you really think they're going to keep the layout the same? So that everyone else can follow out the same way that you escaped? Really? Yeah, really? But, but he adjusts to it, so... But still. Oh, they've changed everything. Are are you fucking kidding me? You didn't think that was going to happen? <laughs> really? God, you're fucking dumb. It's not just the outfit. You really are just that fucking dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I've got for this wretched episode. Yes. So we are going to be moving on. Oh, thank God that's over. The Cadmus Creator. John, I can't read his mind. His brain's been altered to resist me. You don't owe anything to them. They manipulated you and then tried to kill you. So I keep hearing. From who? All you need to know is that I will get free. And I will kill you. If that's your final word. I only use this as a last resort. It's going to send you to another dimension. You won't be hurt, but you also won't hurt anyone else again. You wish you killed me.
You'll do anything to avoid monitor duty. Sent him off to the Phantom Zone, didn't you? He left us no choice. Spoken like a true Justice Lord. What? Come on! Passing judgment like gods? With our superpowered army and our orbiting death ray? Cadmus is right to be scared. The human race wouldn't stand a chance. We'd never go there. It isn't in our nature, and nothing can change that. Nothing? What if Luthor does become president, like he did in their world? What would stop you from doing what that Superman did? There's always that kryptonite you carry around. You don't get to joke! Not today. I just took a bullet for you. Up next is the Doomsday Sanction. As she prepares to leave her high-security home for work, Amanda Waller watches a news report that Lex Luthor has announced his candidacy for the U.S. presidency. Standing in the shower, she is shocked to find Batman standing outside, having entered the house without tripping the alarms. He confronts her about the secret work she is doing against the Justice League, and she retorts that she is operating under the government's authority in response to the Justice Lords incident. Her department was ordered to prepare defenses against the Justice League should it ever go rogue. The way she sees it and her cohorts are the people the only ones protecting against... Uh, she and her cohorts are the people's only protection against the metahumans. Batman warns her against attacking his comrades and leaves. Waller receives his threat without a blink, but when she grabs the phone to trigger the alarms, she is surprised to find her hand shaking. Aboard the Watchtower, Batman explains the Cadmus agenda at a closed meeting of the seven founding members. Superman says that there is no funding for Cadmus, secret or otherwise, in the federal budget, and this speculates that Luthor is possibly the source of its funding. Well, duh. Um, at the same time, Waller holds a summit meeting of Cadmus's department heads. After various progress reports, she turns to Dr. Milo, whose work with splicing animals has failed to produce any results. Milo shake, shakily tries to defend himself, but Waller orders his department terminated, and he is reassigned to a lower-ranking position. In bitterness, Milo steals into the chamber where the Doomsday sanction, or the Doomsday weapon is being held prisoner. Amazingly, he is almost completely recovered from being lobotomized by the, by the Justice Lord Superman. Milo explains to Doomsday that his existence is a lie. He is a flawed clone of Superman created by Emile Hamilton and conditioned by Hamilton, Waller, and Hugo Strange to hate Superman. It was them, not Superman, who tormented Doomsday, and it is them whom he should take revenge on. Doomsday appears to accept this and agrees to solve both their problems if Milo releases him. Milo does, and Doomsday quote-unquote solves Milo's problems by killing him before returning to his ingrained agenda, killing Superman. Wow, that scene was really dark. <laughs> um, so Superman is engaged with a League team assisting an evacuation from the small island of San Baccaro. Or, yeah, yes, San Baccaro. Uh, the volcano of which is in danger of erupting. While Wonder Woman and Flash conduct the evacuation at the harbor, Superman plans to bore holes through the mountain's sides, venting the lava to prevent more dangerous eruption. Before he can begin, Doomsday arrives and attacks, and their battle threatens to bring the volcano down. Hearing the news of Doomsday escapes, Doomsday's escape, Waller angrily orders General Eiling to contain the mess at San and sanction Doomsday. She doesn't care how. Eiling takes her order as an invitation to fire a nuclear missile with a kryptonite warhead at San Baguero. John Jean detects the missile launch from the watchtower. Batman immediately calls Waller on the special hotline to her office connected only to the White House, giving her another shock, and tells her to abort the missile. Waller plays it cool, but Batman can tell she didn't know Eiling's plan. Jean reports that Captain Adam is too far away to reach the missile, and Batman leaps to action, rushing down to the Javelin Bay. He performs an emergency launch into space, hurdles his ship down through the atmosphere, despite Jean's warning that he is risking burn-up. Waller confronts Eiling, ordering him to abort the missile. Eiling tells her that it is already past the point of no return. Jean calls Wonder Woman, warning her to evacuate the island immediately. She tells Flash to go with the last ships, and that she is going back for Superman. As Batman's javelin trails the missile, he fires a pair of rockets, but the missile has magnetic repulsor field. 
There is only one way to stop it now, and Batman doesn't hesitate. He charges the javelin with its own magnetic field and clamps onto the missile, managing to steer it off course. As the javelin and missile overshoot the island and fly out to sea, Batman ejects. The ship crashes into the ocean and there is a colossal explosion, followed by a tidal wave that swamps Batman's escape pod. Uh, John calls him on the radio, but there is no response. On the island, Superman has taken savage beating from Doomsday and is desperate enough that he tries the unthinkable, burning into Doomsday's brain with his heat vision. But this doesn't exactly work, and Superman changes tactics, grabbing Doomsday and hurling him into the volcano's... Ma? What the hell? Uh, the seismic upset caused by landing uh, causes the eruption that Superman was trying to avoid. The island, through mercifully uninhabited, is destroyed. Aboard the Watchtower, five of the seven founders hold a tribunal for Doomsday, imprisoned in a block of cooled magma. Like Milo, Superman tries to tell Doomsday that he has been used by Cadmus and asks Doomsday to reveal what he knows. Doomsday retorts that he will escape one day and will go right back to trying to kill Superman. Feeling that they have no choice, Superman uses a Phantom Zone projector to send Doomsday into the penal dimension. Batman is recuperating in the infirmary, injured but not severely after his crash. He expresses disgust at Superman's decision, saying that such arbitrary action is exactly what Cadmus has reason to fear. He asks Superman point blank what would happen if Luthor does become president, but Superman assures him that the League would never cross that line. As Superman leaves him, Bruce is left in the darkness, seeing another one of Luthor's campaign commercials. On the news, he is silently deliberates what would happen if the League did cross that line. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, okay, well, I'm going to go first on this one. Uh, you know something's up when the monitors go out and then get dressed. It's time we talked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I didn't know where the... When I first saw this episode, I did not know where this episode was going. In the beginning. Oh, wow. Uh, I really enjoyed the round table effect. That was very cool. Uh, watching b- between the two camps, that, that little spindle thing, that was nice. Yep. We finally get a Doomsday backstory. Yay. Kind of. I mean, at least within this own universe here. Uh, J. Jonah Jameson is General Eiling. Very awesome. It, it works with the mustache. J.K. Simmons voiced Eiling. That was very cool. Um, Batman loves attempting suicide. He's a martyr, really. Uh, I I knew as soon as John said Captain Adam was too far yeah. away and that and and that there was no time, I knew what he was gonna do. I mean, and, and it's always with radiation. Yep. <laughs> He wants to go bald. bald with yeah, really. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the flame slash fire effects after Doomsday is thrown into the volcano. That was a nice, cool effect. Um, and this is one of the only times that Batman really, really gets angry at Superman. He's like, you don't get to joke. Not today. I just took a bullet for you. Uh, that was a very intense line. It was. And then, of course, at the end, oh, President Luther. You know it's going to happen. <laughs> uh, spent $75 million on a fake campaign. Oh, wait, that's that's later. N- anyway, um, so what did you think of Doomsday Sanction? Oh, God. Okay, um, Walker in the morning almost seems like a normal normal person. Yeah, Waller, yeah. Um, again, you see Luther for president. Um, Bats has the best entrance ever. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, and like, it, every, every episode, he just, he knows how to make an entrance. Yep. Um, and we see that Waller, even Waller has the nerves when it comes to, to Bats. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I love that. Let's put a pin on that theory, and we'll come back to that, Wally. <laughs> you just got to keep me alive. Yeah. 
Um, if Bat says that someone isn't wound a bit too tight, that's coming from Batman. What does that say exactly? Well, all right, they're they're talking about the question because at one point he says he's he put the question on it, and and if someone can if someone can find answers, the question can, and they're all like, oh man, and I think Flash is, oh man, not that kook. And Batman's like, I admit he's wound a little too tight, but he can get the job done. I mean, you know, I don't know too much about the question. I know, I believe Steve Ditko created him. I think I'm correct in that. But again, I'm not a comic, you know, guru here. Uh, the question technically is Batman without all the gadgets and with more conspiracy theories. That pretty much wraps him up. <laughs> oh, the current, the current one isn't too bad. Well, I'm not saying that they're bad. I, I mean, I, I, I love the question uh, later on. So I mean, he's a really cool character, especially in this because it's something you don't normally. See. And it's one thing later um, that we'll get to. Like some of these characters that I've never really heard. Like I, I had, before seeing this series. Never knew who the question was. Never knew who Shining Knight or or um, Vigilante were. And it's like you know, it's not just Batman anymore that is the only one that doesn't have any powers. Nope. So, which was the whole issue with Wildcat? Yeah. Overcompensation. <laughs> um, Tala seems pretty cool. Um, she doesn't seem exactly human, but. Tala, she's not human. I, I don't. I don't think she is. You know who voices her? No, Juliet Landau. That sounds familiar. Enlighten me. Oh, man. you would have to ask me that. Um, oh, crap! I can't believe you asked me that. Uh, we'll see. come back to it. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll come back to that. We'll table. We'll, we'll, we'll put a pin in that for another time. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, so I, I really do respect Waller's character. However, who fires somebody and doesn't have security walk them out? Oh, I know it. Really? Yeah. Really? If he's got free range of the base? No. Yeah. Um, especially when he comes across as not exactly being the most mentally there person. Um. Okay, so different origin for Doomsday than I know, but hey, why not make it streamlined for the, the TV show? Um, so how exactly is Superman breathing in, you know, that underground volcano? <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not with you there. Again, that's me being science geek. Um, they have a they do have a contingency plan if Doomsday goes rogue. Galatea. Yeah, that's true. I bet they didn't think of that. Um, let's see. Uh, Batman's ride. Oh yeah, <laughs> that um, that specific black javelin. Yeah, that's pretty damn sweet. Let's see what else? Um, interestingly enough, when they're in the um, the deliberation room with um. Uh, with Doomsday, there's no spot for Hawk Girl. Yeah, there's a spot for Batman, <laughs> but no Hawk Girl. Well, didn't they say five of the seven members are there? They were, but there was still two missing of the original seven, and there was so, only spots for six. Oh, uh, hmm. Only six spot, six seats. Dun, dun, dun. Hmm. Uh, Weird. So when Di Diana comes down to swoop and save Superman, even she looks pissed off. Like, come on. You can dig through a volcano and you're really just going to sit there as the lava washes over you. And you look so defeated. Seriously? You're just going to stop worrying about gravity and start floating away. <laughs> Why does she need to come save your ass? <laughs> stop being a pansy, soups. You don't happen to watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer at all, do you? I have. Drusilla is Juliet Landau. Oh. Okay. She is also the daughter of the Academy Award winning actor Martin Landau and Golden Globe nominated actress Barbara Bain. 
stars of Mission Impossible. Awesome. Yeah. I knew I recognized her from somewhere. Okay, so the last thing I have is at the end when we're seeing Bruce being all pissed off and he's staring at the thing with Luther, you have to wonder going through his mind, does he believe that Cadmus is right? Being the one person out of the core seven that from the all the other uh, episodes. All right. Without any powers, does he believe that they are right? And at that juncture, it harkens back to the story arc in JLA of the Tower of Babel, where right. he f- had contingency, contingency plans on how to take out every member of the Justice League. I think if you look at Batman in the DCAU, just in the cartoons from the anim- Batman the Animated Series to Batman Beyond Justice League, he was in a few a few episodes of Superman because they crossed over. Um, if you look at him in just this cartoon continuity, his whole mantra is whatever it takes to get the job done. So I think, and this is just my own personal opinion, I think that he would draw a line somewhere. I don't know if he would necessarily side with the government because he does have a loyalty, even though, quote unquote, according to him, he is a part timer. He does have a loyalty to the just the Justice League. And I mean, these are Clark is his friend. Diana is his friend slash love interest. Uh, you know, so I honestly don't know where his loyalty would lie. I'm not really sure if it came down to it. As far as the league going rogue, I don't know if he would side with with the government. I'm not sure. But um, one of the things that really did pop up, though, was when he and uh, Waller are, you know, screaming at each other, in in essence, you know. Yeah. He says, um, if a league the league wouldn't go rogue, et cetera, et cetera. If you do anything, the league would stop you. He doesn't say I would stop you. Right. He says the league. Well, you got to think within this cartoon universe, Batman doesn't kill, not, not directly. Okay. And Batman doesn't kill in general. He doesn't do guns. He, you know, and we'll, we'll come to that gun situation later, a few episodes down the line in, in this podcast lifespan. But, um, so whether, I I don't know, even though he said the league will stop you, whether that means imprisoning the Cadmus people, as far as like the top tier people, like, like Waller and and Emil and all that, I I don't know what he means. I, I mean, I know his whole mantra is whatever it takes to get the job done and get it done correctly, but, um... I just thought it was very interesting that instead of saying I, I, I'll stop you, it's like he's actually really accepted being part of the league. Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing is throughout this whole, ever since we've gone unlimited, we've seen him constantly at the watchtower. Just in, I mean, just in background shots, not, not, not even episodes that he's really in as far as him being like a main character in that. I mean, you know, um, uh, initiation, even though he was in most of that, but it, like at the very end, I may I remember I made a note about it when we did that episode. He's just walking along the watchtower and is like, "Wow, really? You're not in the back cave doing your stuff?" <laughs> it's like, "What the hell, man?" <laughs> oh, sorry, all along the watchtower. Yeah, <laughs> Dave Matthews Band version. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know why he's at the the watchtower so much? Well, everyone knows where the Batcave is. No, not everyone. It just seems like suddenly, bam! Somebody's the, at the Batcave. No. Bam! Somebody's at the Batcave. Not everyone. So, <laughs> we got anything else for this one? That's all I got for this one. All right, we are gonna move, on. move on. Yeah, we're moving on here. You know, this might not be the best place to talk. Our friends up in the sky have very good ears and eyes. Not a problem, convict. The previous tenant had to leave in a hurry, but he was pretty good about security. Floyd Lawton, a.k.a. Deadshot. 
meet Task Force X. George Harkness, a.k.a. Captain Boomerang, expert thief and inventor. Temple Fugit, the Clock King. Planner, tactician, expert with locks and systems infiltration. And Betty Sensu-C, current alias Plastique, explosives expert. Hmm, I know. I've seen the pictures. And that's all you're gonna see, killer. Enough of this now. Let's get stuck into the business at hand, eh? Agreed. Time is of the essence. It's a blue fortress crawling with superheroes. Even if we do get in, what chance do we have? That's what I'd like yeah, to know. Listen to me. We've got one advantage. This tower is so big and there's so much staff on it, no one's going to notice us. Three, two, one. And finally tonight, we have Task Force X. At Bell Reef Correctional, Floyd Lawton is being led to his execution, apparently uncensored. Unconcerned. Wow. <laughs> Before entering the chamber, his guards are intercepted by a tall man bearing release papers. The warden is appalled. Lawton, a.k.a. Deadshot, has murdered the death penalty many times over. But he, sees he has no choice after examining the papers. On the drive away from the prison, Floyd S Savior introduces himself as U.S. Colonel Rick Flagg, and that Deadshot is being recruited for a top-secret mission which he can either accept or go right back to his execution. The mission is a simple break-in and theft from the Watchtower. At headquarters, Lawton is introduced to the rest of Task Force X. Explosive expert Bet Sansushi, a.k.a. Plastique, inventor George Harkness, a.k.a. Captain Boomerang, and planning expert Temple Fugit, a.k.a. The Clock King. All of them, with the exception of Flag are likewise criminals being offered amnesty in exchange for their services. The plan largely fugits calls for Task Force X to infiltrate the Watchtower disguised as members of the support staff at a time when only three major obstacles are aboard, Green Lantern, Captain Adam, and Jean Jones. Flag warns the other members that there is to be no unnecessary killing. The first phase goes off perfectly. The squad members ambush a group of four Watchtower staffers before they are teleported up. Once in, Deadshot Plastique head over to the lower levels and into the generator room, while Flag and Boomerang make their way to the high security storage. Plastique sets off a bomb on the reactor to cause a diversion for Boomerang breaking through the vault. There, Flag takes control of the package, the Annihilator. Jean orders the watchtower evacuated. Green Lantern assists with the evacuation while Captain Adam flies down to contain the reactor explosion. Once there, he reports to Jean the explosion was not an accident. Jed Shot and Plastique spread up to join Flag and Boomerang, and together they and the Annihilator make their way to the bridge. Along the way, they are stopped by Shining Knight, Vigilante, and Atom Smasher, but manage to defeat them with the Annihilator's help. Reaching the bridge, they are confronted by Jean. Plastique creates a diversion by holding a bomb above the throat of an unconscious Atom Smasher, and Jean reluctantly allows the others to mount the transporter platform. But as Plastique runs to join them, Captain Adam arrives and tackles her, and one of her bombs goes flying. Deadshot explodes it with a shot from his pistol, and in the confusion, three of Task Force X and the Annihilator transport away. Plastique is left behind, severely wounded. Jean checks the transporter console which has been sabotaged and blows up before he can trace the coordinates. Flag returns the armor over to Waller and Talia. Before leaving, Waller commends Flag, telling him his father would be proud of him. Deadshot bids everyone a cheerful goodbye, but Flag decks him with a punch and informs him that he has joined Task Force X for five years before he can go free. Aboard the Watchtower, Sean has realized that Vance, a member of the bridge crew, passed the inside information to Task Force X that allowed their operation to succeed. He is tempted to use his telepathy to, war to wipe Vance's mind clean, but Lantern tells him that would be pointless. Vance has already passed on along everything he knows. When Sean objects that they can't just trust him with any further information, Lantern grimly reminds him that they can't trust any of their staff. Your thoughts, sir? Now I saw this episode after I saw um I rewatched this after I had seen um Justice League New Frontier. 
So first note, obviously, Colonel Flag, yay! Because I remember Colonel Flag being in uh, uh, New Frontier, the DVD New Frontier. Now, is this the same flag, or is it his father? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. Um, could have been his father, actually, now that I think about it. Uh, but still, same name. Yep. Rick Flag Jr., Rick Flag Sr., so... They could have different middle names. Yeah, true. Uh, Deadshot, yay. Uh, what's the target? Unimpressed. JLA had, or JLU headquarters. <laughs> it's just, the, the way that he delivered the line, it's like, he's just like so unimpressed. He's like, matter of fact, Justice League headquarters. It's like, what? <laughs> and of course. We have, yeah, really. Um, and we haven't seen this guy since Batman the Animated Series. Yay, Clock King! I thought that's where I saw him before. <laughs> yep. Uh, it's very interesting to see the Justice League and the Watchtower described from an outsider's point of view. Yeah. Because they're coming into this thing like, oh, holy shit, what are we doing here? <laughs> We're a bit over our heads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, hey, no using light speed bars as cover. What the hell? <laughs> um, oh, wow. Evacuate the tower. Yikes. Because that was a bad explosion right there. Um, and, of course, and I think that Carl Lumbly did, delivered this line fairly well. He's gotten better delivering lines as Jean, but I think this one really, really... Uh, Ask yourselves, is being in here with me what you truly desire? <laughs> <laughs> I guess there is um, I guess there is a severe disadvantage of being a huge army of superheroes. I mean, really, seriously, because... You get a lot of angry people. Well, not even a lot of angry people, but, I mean, they have all these staff members now. And if anybody can just replace four of them, you know, it's, it's, first of all, how, now, now that I think about, now that I've said that, how the hell did John or GL or any of them not see these people in the field? Hello, they look down on the earth at all times. I don't maybe, know. Maybe the guy was, that informed them was doing monitor duty on that specific area. Maybe. Maybe that's that, why they knew where to go. That could be it. Um, and like you said in the synopsis, there's no recall on that location. They've thought of everything. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't too and then of course, yeah. And, and then of course, GL at the end. Jean, we can't trust anyone now. <sighs> Who's who, seriously? Who does the security on these on these groups? <laughs> They know, really? <laughs> it's just like, wow. There's no security whatsoever. Uh, so what do you got for thoughts or notes? Um, okay. Um, basically, this is the Sinister Six. Or Secret Six. Controlled by Waller. Six members. Former convicts. Working for Amnesty. Yep. Yep. So, Woot. It would have been awesome if they had, like, Bane and um, Catman and the whole the whole team. Problem is, the whole bad embargo oh, at the time. Yeah. But, I mean, Catman? Catman? Right? They had already used him. Oh. Remember? In um, Legends, way back in original JL. Season two, I think. Yeah. But still, like, Ragdoll. Ragdoll would have been cool. Uh, of course, how exactly would you get him in? I don't know. But, um, let's see. We got to see Digger Hart- Harkness, who I love that character for some reason. Not <laughs> just because he was in Green Lantern at Blackest Night, but way back when we had the, um, what was it? Um, it wasn't Identity Crisis, was it? It might have been Identity Crisis where he is really looked down on by the rest of the villainous community 
and he gets one last job, and that's to assassinate um, Robin's father, and in the process dies. But um, I really liked him ever since that, and, and it, he is one of the Flash rogues. So it was nice to see him. Um, okay, right. so villain flirting, kind of creepy. <laughs> kind of creepy. Uh, well, it was. You mean between uh, Plastique and Deadshot? Yeah, it was just like, come on, killer, come on, killer. I'm like, really? You got to come up with another nickname, <laughs> really. Um, we see Jean's darker side. We're seeing a lot of that with the whole Cadmus story arc. Like, lots of characters and what they are capable of doing. And we are yeah. seeing that they're getting slowly pushed to that, that same point that the uh, Justice Lords were. Right. Um, what else? Um, Jean totally kicked ass. Up to the point where the, um, the Annihilator kind of ripped him literally in half. Yeah, that was, that was I was really shocked at that effect. I didn't think they'd do it. I, I really didn't. I thought they were gonna make him like turn into a snake or something, or you know, a thing of silly putty. No, mm-hmm. he gets literally ripped in half. Yeah. Reforms, but still. <laughs> yeah, that was a little extreme, I think. But I mean it's nice that they did that, I guess. It's a nice effect. But it's just like Oh, holy shit. No, they didn't. Yeah, they did. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was lame even for me. Oh, boy. Well, sir, do you have anything else to say about these four episodes? Um, not really. Uh, the, I don't know. I Task Force X, like I said, is a nice outside look at how the league is it's a nice villain perspective but and doomsday sanction has a few nice things about it but the other ones really uh i i don't care for miracles happen or ties that bind or whatever the hell it's called uh and cat and canary is okay because it introduces like dinah and ollie as far as them just starting their relationship um, but I mean, honestly, most of these episodes, I would probably give them on a scale to 10. Most of them, well, I know ties that bind would get a zero for me. Um, uh, Cat and Canary would probably get a five. Um, Doomsday Sanction would probably get a seven and this would probably get an eight just because like I said, it is that whole outside looking in type of story. It's the whole Switch story. And I mean, really, if you look at it, it really has nothing to do with the heroes whatsoever. I mean, yeah, the heroes are there, but I mean, the main, the A story of, of the plot of the episode focuses on the the villain team, which I think was really cool. It was nice, and the more that we get these Cadmus episode story arcs, the more we can definitely see why... But we can see their perspective. Yeah. And it, it, it's nice to see that they're not just, you know, faceless villains. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's it. You're going to hear some audio, and we're going to go to the outro. Don't you understand? We can't trust him. No, we can't trust anyone now. So, thank God this episode of Secret Origins Podcast is finally over. We can actually move on to bigger and better episodes. Holy crap. (laughs) Uh, Diana-centric episode? Yes. Yes. Uh, A bunch of them actually. Not a bunch of Diana-centric episodes, but a bunch of really, really good ones are coming up. So... Thank you for joining us here on the Secret Origins Podcast. There are some ways to get in contact with us or leave feedback for the show. Visit the website, geekcastradio.com. You can comment on each episode post. Leave the show's feedback in iTunes. We still have no iTunes feedback. What is wrong with you people? Don't make me be the first person to what, put one up there. Uh, no, that that would be kind of biased, I think. <laughs> uh, I don't know what you're talking about. 
<laughs> Follow us on Twitter. The show name there is Secret Origins minus TFG and Mike. What is your Twitter, sir? Caminiti Style. C A M I N I T I S T Y L E. Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Become a fan on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash geekcast radio network. We are currently running a Facebook fan page contest. If you help us get to 300 fans, we will give two of those fans, random fans, uh, a Stan Bush prize pack, which includes an autographed CD of Dream the Dream and a t shirt. Uh, call the voicemail line. Tell us to show you're leaving the message for and your name. 502 526 5821. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Secret Origins Podcast. I wish you'll join us next time. We'll be reviewing five more episodes from Justice League Unlimited Season 4. Those being The Balance, Double Date, Clash, Question Authority, and Hunter's Moon, a.k.a. Mystery in Space. For now, I am TFG and Mike with... Lupus Convoy. Thank you for listening. Until next time.